Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you. My name is Jane Ransom. I'm the executive director of the American Brain Foundation. It's wonderful to have you here. I want to introduce you to tonight's host, Kevin Goodnow, who uh, is our immediate past chair of the American Brain Foundation and a, a wonderful board member. Uh, he's an attorney at Frederick and Byron here in the Twin Cities, and he's our past Minnesota Department of Health and Human Services Commissioner. Thank you, Kevin, for hosting us tonight. I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Jane, and appreciate being here tonight and, and, the, uh, and having you all on the, on the um, program tonight. Uh, we have some great speakers today, and I just wanted to welcome you all here today. Um, I was drawn to the American Brain Foundation because of various connections I have brain, with brain disease. Um, and I'm drawn tonight to this issue related to concussions in sport because of three very big issues or important part of my life is my three daughters. Um, all are in college age now, but they were involved in sports throughout the years and uh, all individually suffered a concussion in a different sport at a different age level. Uh, one in middle school basketball, uh, one in college club rugby and another in college soccer. So this is a connection to my family and I, I hope you enjoy the, the program tonight um, as we hear from our hosts and our, our panelists. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. David Dodick, uh, who is the actually the chair, current chair of the American Brain Foundation. Thanks so much, Kevin, and thanks for hosting tonight. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'm glad you could join us. The American Brain Foundation, as you know, <clears throat> funds research across the entire spectrum of brain diseases because <clears throat> our, our mission and our belief is that if you can cure one brain disease or if you can make advances in the treatment of one brain disease, you'll lead to the cure of many because they're so interrelated and interconnected. As, as of today, <clears throat> the American Brain Foundation has invested more than $33 million in research and granted scholarships and funding to more than 270 researchers. So we have a great track record. And I should say that almost 90% of those researchers that we fund go on to secure NIH and other extramural funding. So they become you know, renowned clinician scientists in their own right. The American Brain Foundation's most important partner is our founder, the American Academy of Neurology, which as you may know, is the largest association of neurologists in the world. And every research grant we make is vetted by the Academy's top scientists. So we feel very confident in the research that we fund, that it is top flight research from the best in the field. Our foundation is also committed to sharing valuable resources and increasing public awareness of brain disease. And our virtual salon events like tonight are opportunities to connect with experts in various topics of interest around brain disease. So tonight, one of our experts is Sean Sanseveri, and um, we're going to talk to you about sports concussion. Actually, we'll talk to you about concussion, but Sean is going to really focus on sports concussion. And Sean is a member of the board of the American Brain Foundation. He serves as the vice president of business and legal affairs for the National Football League Players Association. And in that role, Sean leads the NFLPA's health and safety initiatives, including the development and implementation of uh, protective measures that NFL clubs are required to follow in order to minimize occupational health problems, including concussion. And these efforts have resulted in the creation of standardized protocols governing the evaluation and management of concussions, the development of team-specific emergency action plans, and the utilization of independent neurotrauma specialists on the sidelines of all NFL games. And I would say, in fact, given that the National Football League has been the epicenter of this of concussion, a lot of organized sport and many leagues have looked to the NFL um, as a model, actually, given the policies and rules and changes that they've made to make the game safer. <clears throat> Sean also manages the union's medical research initiatives, which include a long term partnership with Harvard University and Harvard Medical School, uh, investment in the Dementia Discovery Fund and, and various efforts to commercialize novel treatment interventions relevant to athlete illnesses and injuries. Um, I didn't actually know this, but Sean is actually the adju an adjunct professor at Georgetown University School of Continuing Studies. So Sean, thank you for being here tonight. I'm going to kick things off by just making a few, a few comments and I'll show some slides just to give you a background on 
where we are with concussion, um, maybe some bad news about concussion, but also some good news about where I think the field is heading. So let me uh, see if I can share my screen here. So <clears throat> this is meant to make you a little dizzy, uh, not meant for you to read, but concussion, and believe it or not, there's not actually much of a consensus around the definition of concussion, but concussion is really a traumatic injury to the brain that disrupts the normal function and structure of the brain that may lead to neurological symptoms and signs. So it's basically an injury to the brain that leads to symptoms and signs that changes its function and changes its structure somewhat. And I put may here and I've italicized that because as you'll hear about, people can have repetitive impacts to the head, especially people who play athletes who play contact and collision sport. Um, but not all of those of course lead to concussion but they may lead to some injury, uh, even though they don't lead to symptoms. So on the left-hand slide here of this slide, all I wanna show you is that the injury at the cellular level is extremely complex, even though we can't see it when we visualize the brain. And so when we do a CAT scan or when we do an MRI scan of the brain, we don't really see much change in the brain, even though someone may have a lot of symptoms related to concussion. The other point I want to make here is not only is the injury complex, but it tends to be microscopic. So because we can't see it at the macro level when we look at an MRI scan, it doesn't mean that there isn't some injury at the micro level. And so what I'm showing you on the right hand side is a special type of MRI that looks at the, the fiber tracks in the brain. And you can see that everything that's red in this is, is not normal. And th this is what an athlete's brain might look like when you scan them with what we call diffusion tensor imaging within 24 to 48 hours of an injury. Even though the MRI scan that you'd get in the clinic or in the emergency department is completely normal. So take home message here is that the injury is incredibly complex. We have a good idea what's happening biologically at the molecular level in, in this injury. And in many cases, it's microscopic. So when someone does a CT scan or an MRI and says, no, you have an edit concussion, uh, you know that they're, that's not correct. Let's see if I can advance this slide here now. Next is how common is concussion? Concussion and mild traumatic brain injury are synonymous, really. We use the terms interchangeably. Um, so mild traumatic brain injury compared to moderate to severe traumatic brain injury is when we typically would see changes in the brain macroscopically when we do an MRI or CT. So my, remember that mild traumatic brain injury really means concussion. According to the World Health Organization, there's about 70 million traumatic brain injuries a year, of which the vast majority, 56 million, are, are mild. So in general, perhaps 50 plus million concussions a year across the globe. But on the right-hand side here, I think what I'm showing you is that we're only sort of, re, it's the tip of the iceberg. So of all the head hits that an individual might take, let's say a, an athlete playing a collision or contact sport, while they might experience, depending on the sport and depending on the position that they play, a several hundred hits to the head per season, none of them may rise to the level that they cause symptoms. So the tip of the iceberg is the concussion. Underneath is the number of hits that an athlete or an individual, a soldier, um, might take that don't give rise to symptoms. And we call those subconcussive hits, subconcussive because they don't give rise uh, to symptoms. And we're becoming increasingly aware now that these repetitive subconcussive hits may cause cumulative damage that may be more injurious to the brain than hits that give rise to symptoms or concussions themselves. So what I'm showing you here are changes in brain structure and function, even in the absence of symptoms. So on the upper left-hand side, you'll see um, high school football players getting a functional MRI scan when they were trying to do complex arithmetic or some other cognitive task. On the left, what their brain looks like before the season, and on the right, what it looks like mid-season or after season. And it doesn't take an imaging specialist to see that there's a difference there, even though the athlete has never reported a concussion. On the right-hand side, we're looking at professional soccer players. And so this is that special type of MRI scan that can be done that shows 
changes in the fiber tracks in the brain. So everything that's red is not entirely normal. And these are in professional soccer players who never reported a concussion. And then finally, down at the bottom, we're looking at uh, individuals who play who, rugby or are experts in mixed martial arts. So, you know, fighting. And what I'm showing you here is breakdown of the barrier that separates the blood from the brain. We have a very protective layer um, over the brain that protects substances in the blood from getting into the brain. And you can see in the middle there, after a match, breakdown in the blood-brain barrier in a fighter or in a rugby player who's not even reporting symptoms. So the take-home message here is that some of the same changes we see in the structure and in the function of the brain with concussion, we see with hits to the head that don't give rise to symptoms so that the athlete doesn't even know they've had a concussion. Now, what are we worried about? And why is this such a, a focus and a, and a hot topic? It's because we're worried about the long-term consequences of concussion. Most individuals fortunately recover from a concussion within several weeks. But what we worry about is the 15 to 20% who develop persistent post-concussion symptoms. And you can see what some of them are there, dizziness, headaches, memory problems, changes in mood, behavior, appetite, fatigue, trouble concentrating. And certainly as a clinician in this, who's focused on seeing some of these athletes, I've seen not only athletes, but soldiers and people who have slips and falls and motor vehicle accidents where these symptoms can persist for months or many years. And then of course, why this has become such a hot topic and why the NFL has become sort of the epicenter of this is that there are some individuals long after they've retired from the sport, and it's not just football, but boxing and ice hockey and soccer, who can develop a progressive degeneration of the brain that can lead to dementia and other really serious consequences. And so that's what we worry about when it comes to concussion. So, you know, we're, we're focused on athletes and we're talking about sports concussion and, you know, about 60% of high school students participate in sport and sport is fantastic. Um, it, it's, uh, it's great for Leadership, building leadership skills and social skills, and it's great aerobic activity and exercise, and it's good for your health. Um, but obviously, we, we worry about some sports in, in, insofar as it can lead to concussion. We talk a lot about concussion in the military. We have over 1 million soldiers now deployed across the globe, and concussion is common in our military operators. But that represents a very small portion of the people who actually experience concussions. So at the bottom, I'm showing you that over three quarters of concussions that occur in the general population are due to slips and falls, due to traffic accidents, or due to hitting, your head, hitting their head on a variety of different objects, falling off a bike, hitting your head on a cupboard, um, you name it. So the vast majority of concussions out there in the population are not occurring necessarily during sport or during uh, war. Uh, but just from routine everyday activities. One thing that often goes unnoticed too is um, the traumatic brain injuries that occur in women as a result of domestic violence. So according to the World Health Organization, 35% of women are subject to violence by their partners at least once in their lifetime. So over one third of women um, are experiencing domestic or intimate partner violence and up to 94% of them sustain injuries to the head or neck. So we don't talk a lot about, or the, you don't hear a lot about traumatic brain injuries in women who are victims of domestic violence, but this is another hidden population uh, where this is a real epidemic and a crisis. So the bad news about concussion is we don't yet have a diagnostic test. There isn't a blood test that we can do, and as I've highlighted, there isn't a scan that we can do of the brain that says, yes, you've had a concussion. Um, we're getting closer though. There's no treatment for concussion. But we do know a lot about what's happening in the brain, and therefore we have targets where we can design treatment specifically to treat the biology of concussion. So we're getting closer, but as yet, no diagnostic test and no treatment. The pathological reactions can persist, as I've alluded to, long after the impact. So concussion is not just an event, um, an acute event, but it may be a chronic condition in some, so that symptoms can persist for many years. These biological changes in the brain that are triggered after an injury can persist for many months or years. And unfortunately, in a small proportion of people, 
especially with repetitive head impacts, you, they can, these people can get into trouble with progressive degeneration of the brain and, and neurological deterioration. And so while we don't really know, we don't really have a treatment yet, there has been some progress. One of the areas where there's been progress is in looking at aerobic exercise after concussion. So, you know, in the past, we used to cocoon these people. We used to put them in a quiet, dark room, and we used to put them at bed rest. Um, we don't do that anymore because that turns out to be counterproductive and actually more injurious to the person. And so recently, when you institute aerobic exercise quickly after a concussion, it leads to faster recovery. And a study that hasn't even been published yet has shown that you can actually reduce the development of post-concussion syndrome, as it used to be called, or those people who go on to develop persistent symptoms by more than 35%. So that's one change in the way we manage this condition. Rather than putting people to bed, uh, we try to get them up and active as quickly as possible. So that's one area of progress. And I think the other area of progress is in when it comes to biomarkers, biomarkers that help us make the diagnosis and biomarkers that help us render prognosis. So identifying people who are likely to get into trouble with delayed recovery, likely to get into trouble with the development of post-concussion syndrome, and possibly those who are likely to get into trouble with long-term neurological deterioration from neurodegeneration. So there's a lot of work being done on biomarkers in the blood, biomarkers in the saliva, um, and imaging. So we know that certain changes in imaging, particularly this specialized type of imaging, can have prognostic value. Because right now we treat most concussions in the same way. And there's a saying that if you've seen one concussion, you've only seen one concussion. Every brain is different, every individual is different, and the way we manage concussion needs to be more personalized and individualized. So up top here, what I'm showing you is a lot of, I'm showing you a neuron uh, in, from the brain and its axon and all of its tentacles. And so NFL and MBP and NSE and all these, all these abbreviations are biomarkers that show up in the blood and now perhaps in the saliva that we can measure shortly after a concussion and be more definitive about the diagnosis. And depending on which marker is elevated and depending on how much it's elevated, it may give us a prognostic value so that we can, sitting down with an individual, tell that individual how long they're likely to be out from play, for example, if we're talking to an athlete. And after we've seen someone perhaps with several concussions, whether or not they should even be returning to the sport. So I think, you know, we're pretty excited about the emergence of these biomarkers that we can measure quantitatively and objectively to make the diagnosis and to render prognosis. So I'm going to stop there now with those introductory comments and hand it over to um, Sean to tell us what the national, what's happening at the National Football League, some of the policies uh, and management protocols that they put in place. Uh, so Sean, please take it away. Thank you, David. Uh, hope everyone out there is staying safe and healthy. Um, thanks to the American Brain Foundation for hosting this discussion tonight. Concussion in sport is a really important topic, but it's one broad and complex enough that a person could spend 10 years of their career working on it and then, of course, struggle to summarize that work in less than an hour, as we're attempting to do tonight. So I'm going to focus primarily on how the NFLPA has approached the, uh, the arena of, of concussion in sport. Suffice it to say that concussion evaluation and management is one of, if not the most important issues that, that team health and safety at the NFL Players Association has, has tackled over the years. It's really a legacy issue for us. Dating all the way back to 2010, we authored a letter on behalf of the NFLPA to the NFL that said, you, the National Football League, have an obligation to articulate the standards being applied to protect players. This needed to come in the form of a comprehensive concussion evaluation and management protocol. And here it is attached to this letter. Not only did we demand a standardized approach to this injury, but we designed it and drafted it. From the jump, we proposed things like independent sideline concussion experts, booth spotters, redundant communications that were modeled after uh, airline travel, medical timeouts, 
and discipline for putting competitive considerations ahead of healthcare considerations. We negotiated over this seminal approach to concussion care in sport, and about a year later, a year and a half later, the NFL agreed to adopt it. That protocol has continued to evolve, but it's really become the backbone of so much of the work that we've done with the league over the past decade. To that end, it, it, it is in some ways a catalyst for years of collaboration with the NFL to improve the care of the player patient. And the way we diagnose and treat concussion on game day is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of how we handle healthcare in an inherently dangerous occupation. Our work in player health and safety is governed by three main principles. First, we follow the science. We go nowhere the science doesn't bring us. Second, health and safety is non-negotiable. Really, there is nothing more important in our overall workplace. And finally, whole player, whole life, whole family. This recognizes the interconnectedness of the health of our athletes to their family, to the community and beyond. These guiding principles inform an ever-expanding portfolio of efforts to make the game safer and to improve the lives of our members. A timely example of this would be our approach to COVID last season, where we made sure to fit football into the virus and not the virus into football. This allowed us to be the only sport to play all 256 regular season games, the playoffs, and the Super Bowl without interruption. It also informs a huge investment in preventative measures around all injuries. Specific to concussion, we laboratory test every single helmet and validate these results with on-field performance and injury rates. This has led us to ban certain poor performing helmets from, uh, from use on game day, and it has resulted in a great deal of innovation by the helmet manufacturers themselves. We also are in the fourth year of a censored mouth guard program designed to understand impact forces related to concussion and ultimately create position specific helmets. For example, this past year, we learned that offensive linemen experience more rotational forces than defensive linemen, something we never would have known without investing in this program. This data will ultimately allow us to spur innovation and create more effective safety equipment. As a union, the science also drives decisions and negotiation positions in connection with the NFL work environment. Things like rule changes, elimination of two days of certain contact rules, contact integration during the training period, all the way back in 2011, would save a player over 70,000 hits during his career. Finally, the science and our commitment to the whole player has resulted in a tremendous amount of medical research. A few programs to highlight tonight. The football player health study at Harvard, which David mentioned, was launched in 2014. We then, back then, we created a coordinated research network that has become the largest study of living former athletes in history. This is an occupational cohort study designed to understand the incidence and severity of illnesses and injuries experienced as a result of playing professional football. The goal is to identify one of my favorite buzzwords, the maladaptive phenotype. In other words, why two players with similar exposure and experience playing in the NFL have very different long-term health outcomes. This study has over 55 novel findings, many related to brain health and concussion, and will continue to inform the science for many years to come. We also invest directly into treatment interventions, things like near-red infrared light treatment for TBI, an antibody therapy for tau, and the Dementia Discovery Fund, which was mentioned earlier, as well as many non-brain related um, treatment efforts, uh, things like bioenhanced ACL repair, uh, a self-titrating hydrogel, and a whole bunch of other stuff that sounds like it's out of Star Trek. Similarly, we are investing in health equity research as well as an innovative approaches to understanding neurodegenerative disease progression. Specifically, we have partnered with the Cleveland Clinic, Google, Morehouse, the Alzheimer's Driven Data Initiative, and others to use machine learning tools and artificial intelligence to understand neurodegenerative disease progression and treatment patterns in order to better inform clinical care, not only of our athletes, but society at large. So that serves as a brief summary of the work that's ongoing on behalf of our player patients and I'll, I'll finish by simply saying that we see it as our obligation to challenge the NFL as the employer to do a better job with health and safety. 
No matter how far we've come, there will always be room for improvements. Our work with organizations like the American Brain Foundation helped further this important mission, not just on behalf of professional athletes, as the work we do influences and impacts patients at all levels in sport and beyond. So with that, um, I think we would like to open it up for discussion. Thank you, Sean. Yes, absolutely. So please um, write your questions in the chat box or, or open your mic and you know, we're happy to take your questions live as well. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to pose to Sean or I now, or shall I start reading some out of the uh, text box, chat box? Well, let me start here. The first question is many states have enacted laws on how to minimize concussion in high school sports. Is there data to show if this has been a benefit? Yeah, the data, I'll tell you that some recent data would suggest that most concussions actually during a football season or um, football season in particular, and this was shown at the NCAA level, actually occur during the preseason and most uh, actually occur during practice. So there have been some rule change, the policy changes where they reduce the number of practices and they reduce the number of preseason games. And so that, that actually is making a difference. And on top of that, there have been some policy decisions made both in soccer, um, ice hockey, and at, in some states for football where they've re minimized or eliminated contact until kids hit a certain age. Usually it's around the age of 14. So in soccer, for example, and in ice hockey, you can't body check or you can't head the ball until uh, the age of 14. So, and those rule changes have actually reduced the incidence of concussion. So it just goes to show you that the data that we're generating in terms of when these concussions occur, like during practice in the preseason, um, which athletes are, 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 are most vulnerable, those typically before the age of, of 14. Um, and you know, recovery tends to be longer in those athletes. Um, as we get more and more data, we're understanding how to make the game safer with rule changes and policy changes, some of which Sean's actually talked about. And Sean, maybe you make a comment about how some of these policy changes have led to tangible reductions in the incidence of concussion in the National Football League. Yeah, I'd love to foot, sp foot stomp the power of data. We have a robust injury surveillance system in the NFL that's powered by electronic medical records. And so we record every last concussion. We go back and reconstruct that through video. We have RFID chips in every single helmet. We are able to paint a picture of exactly how that injury occurred. And now that we have this censored mouth guard program, we can even analyze the impact forces um, directly. Uh, the data from our injury surveillance system has is ultimately what has fueled a 40%, 45% reduction in concussion over the last four years compared to the previous four years. Um, is it enough? No. Um, we have to continue to make uh, progress, as I said before, but the need for a national TBI registry for these type of data sets, um, I don't think we can understress the importance of that. Yeah. Question here, what kind of MRI was... Uh, on the micro level. So the MRI scan I was showing you are, um, is what's called diffuse tensor, tensor imaging. So it's an MRI scan that is typically, it's a sequence that's not typically done when you can get a conventional MRI scan. And at, it's not ready for prime time yet. So I wouldn't want you to ask to have a diffusion tensor image uh, MRI to see if there's been changes yet because it's not been shown to be sensitive yet at the level of the individual. Most of the time we're looking at groups of individuals. And so we, so we see changes in a, a group of concussed athletes compared to a group of individuals who haven't been concussed. Um, but we are, you know, I think in the future, hopefully we'll have sequences that can be done at the level of the individual that will actually be able to show some of the changes that I demonstrated to you at the group level. But that was what's called the diffusion tensor MRI. The question here, does CTE occur exclusively after repetitive TBI or does a single TBI trigger it as well? There's really no good evidence that single traumatic brain injuries um, or even multiple traumatic brain injuries give rise to chronic traumatic encephalopathy or other dementia syndromes. It's, we think that it's the repetitive head impact exposure that individuals experience 
on top of concussions that can occur that give rise to um, and are most important in leading to progressive neurodegeneration of the type we see in chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So for those of you who have had a concussion before, including myself, I don't think you really have anything to worry about in terms of developing CTE. Son? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Ma'am, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little puzzled and I sent Sean a private message and I just see one from a friend of mine. Um, I would like to know why you have not mentioned this absolutely fabulous collar that was designed by Dr. David Smith and has been approved by the FDA to prevent concussion and traumatic brain injury. And not only, in, and well, it was tested for sports injury starting at the age, I believe, of 13. Yeah, great, uh, good sales pitch too. I mean, that was a great commercial. Um, I'm not with, I am, I do not represent them. I know Dr. David Smith, the inventor of it. I know Greg Meyer, the gentleman, the PhD researcher at the Children's Hospital of Cincinnati University. I know both of them very well. And I'm just kind of surprised that this is, thank you very much for doing this. This is a phenomenal thing. I'm the thriver of two TBIs and five concussions. So when I found out about Dr. Smith and Dr. Greg's work uh, about four or five years ago now, I jumped on it immediately. And I talked to Pew Collar at least once or twice a week about their product, because I'm all about preventing TBI, all yeah. about it. Absolutely. And, and two of our closest advisors um, uh, on our Mackie White um, Health and Safety Committee, which was originally a TBI uh, committee, have done a ton of research with uh, the product. And um, one of them, Julian Bales, is actually uh, on the board and I think one of the founders of it. Um, the evidence, so obviously it's FDA approved for um, safety. Uh, efficacy is a whole different subject. Um, the evidence so far suggests it is safe, of course. Um, otherwise, the FDA wouldn't approved it. There is some evidence that it attenuates some brain MRI changes that occur over a course of a season. The significance and meaning of those changes is unknown, but wearing the collar seems to decrease those changes. Um, I know that some of our advisors conducted animal studies as a lab part of the NFL long study. If anybody wants information on that, we can share it. Um, but there is no evidence yet that wearing the collar is associated with the incident of concussion. So ultimately, um, we want to follow this product as we do with all diagnostic tools, treatment tools and the like. Um, we would not recommend this yet based on the current level of science um, that has been developed to support it, but we are following it very closely. Okay, yep. thank you. I have little to add to that other than at uh, last weekend, we held the American Academy of Neurology's annual concussion summit. And we actually had two experts come in and independently review uh, the collar and the data. And their, their conclusion was exactly what uh, Sean just mentioned. There isn't enough evidence yet to support the widespread use of this in, in not only in National Football League players, but in collegiate players or high school players yet. So it isn't, it isn't the, the efficacy isn't established and it's not, it's not quite ready for prime time, according to at least the experts who reviewed this independently for the academy. Very interesting. I'd like to talk to those experts. Okay, well, well, maybe we'll talk afterward. Please, yes, I would really like that. Thank you. There's a question here, are the effects of repetitive concussions additive or exponential? Um, you know, I think certainly the effects of repetitive concussions depends on the time interval between the concussions. So. It's quite clear that if you experience a concussion today and you experience another concussion within the next couple of weeks, before your brain has had a chance to completely recover or heal, if you will, and I use the term a little loosely, but before you've had a chance to completely recover, then the, the injury can be more significant and the symptoms can be a longer lasting. So it really depends on the interval of time. So I would say that in response to that question, the injury and the recovery can be more severe and longer lasting. And so in that way, I guess it can be exponential or multiplicative. But if you experience a concussion this year and you experience a concussion next season, it's not quite clear whether those are additive or exponential, certainly not exponential. But I will tell you that there's some data emerging from the largest concussion study 
that has been conducted to date, and that's the NCAA DOD Care Consortium, where they've collected over 5,000 concussions from over 40,000 athletes and military cadets. And it seems that one of the most potent prognosticators of who's going to go on to develop a delayed recovery and persistent symptoms is the presence of two or more concussions. So it does seem that the more concussions you sustain, um, the more likely it is that future concussions may lead to a longer recovery period and perhaps a higher likelihood of developing persistent symptoms. Um, I don't want to be de too definitive about that because the data is just emerging now. And I hate to put a number on it because, you know, there are individuals who have experienced more than two concussions who do just fine, return to play and have very productive careers. So I hate putting a number on things, but just know that in response to this question that, you know, and certainly I've seen in my practice that if an individual has experienced several concussions, subsequent concussions, if I see them, if I see that after the first concussion, they took a couple of days to recover. And then after the fourth concussion, they're taking a few months to recover. I'm going to worry more about that individual. Um, so it's, it's, it's not just looking at the number of concussions, but the duration of recovery it's taken to get back to normal after subsequent concussions. There's a question here. Can localized brain injury eventually lead to brain tumors such as a glioblastoma? Not to my knowledge. I don't think there's any evidence that a traumatic brain injury or concussion or even repetitive head impacts uh, increases the risk for a glioblastoma or other types of brain tumors. Can you make a mention about professional boxers? Um, what, 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 what specifically, sir? It would seem to me that professional boxers and um, uh, Mac, uh, mixed martial arts performers uh, would be receiving uh, concussions uh, every time they go into the ring. Um, are they? Have they been studied? They have actually. There, there's quite. Um, ex they've been extensively studied actually, and there's a big study at the Cleveland Clinic who follow um, these fighters uh, over a long period of time. And you're correct. They take multiple repetitive hits to the head. And we do see changes in both structure and function in their brain, um, both acutely after bouts and even long term. So, you know, I, for one, am concerned about the, the repetitive hits that they take, even if it doesn't give rise to concussion. Um, but so there's been quite a bit of study in, in boxers and mixed martial artists. Can I ask a question relative to that? Sure. <clears throat> um... Many states have medical advisors to the sport of boxing. Do you think it's ethical for physicians to participate in doing this? It's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll, my answer will be that I was asked uh, to actually serve on, on such a commission and decided and decided against it because I, I actually can't condone as a neurologist knowing what I know about what happens to the brain after you impact it. Um, I can't actually condone um, watching an individual take repeated hits to the head. Now, my colleagues will argue that having a brain expert on the sideline, recognizing when an individual's in trouble is an obligation that we have. If the sport's going to happen and people are going to fight, there's an obligation that we have as clinicians who are expert in this area to be there to recognize when um, you know, an individual needs to be pulled from the ring or a fight has to be stopped um, or how that individual is supposed to be evaluated and managed after a bout. So that's one side of the argument. If, there, if it's gonna happen, let's have experts there to keep it as safe as possible. And so I guess that, that would be my answer uh, to that question. I haven't chosen to participate in that myself, um, but I feel somewhat reassured that if boxing, you know, I don't think boxing and mixed martial arts are going anywhere anytime soon. So having experts there uh, to keep those individuals as safe as possible, because we've seen some catastrophic outcomes, obviously, um, uh, inside the ring of, of individuals dying, uh, that can't happen. So. 
I, I feel like uh, I understand where my colleagues who serve on these commissions and who serve ringside, I understand why they do what they do. I was never asked to serve on a commission, so I get off easy on that one. But the medical ethics question for, for something that is ultimately an inherently dangerous occupation, that's, that's how we look at it for our, our members um, and certainly as on the professional level across all sports. The medical ethics component is a fascinating one, and I think it starts with a Hippocratic oath for the physician's duty to the patient. And that is something that we focus on heavily as it relates to competitive considerations of the fact that team doctors are employees of the NFL club um, and making sure that those sort of mixed incentives are ultimately uh, not abused. But the question then follows, well, why employ a physician um, on behalf of the club? And I think the, the way to look at it is in coal mines and oil rigs, employers hire physicians, but that doesn't change their Hippocratic oath. It still is to the patient, and in our case, the player patient. There's a question here. Can symptoms of concussion continue to improve, or is there no hope for improvement after a certain amount of time? When can one, what can one do to continue improvement? Um, so post con persistent post-concussive symptoms are roughly defined as symptoms that persist three months after an injury. And my response to that question is that po persistent post-concussive symptoms can and do improve. I have many patients who, who improve over time. And uh, one of the first patients I actually saw as a clinician when I first started practice was a professional ice hockey player. And I told him when I saw him that after a concussion that he will likely improve within a three month period of time. This was more than 20 some odd years ago. And he came back and three years later I saw him and we become friends. And he said, you know, you remember when you saw me, you told me I was gonna get better in three months, six months at the longest. It took me fully 18 months to be back to normal. And so that's an indication that here's a guy who probably had taken multiple repetitive hits before. It wasn't his first concussion, by the way. And he had post-concussion syndrome. But 18 months later, he was, he was back to normal or what he thought was, was normal. So yes, these, these, these individuals can improve, do improve. Um, but unfortunately, there's a small proportion who do not and who continue to have persistent symptoms. And I've seen them you know, 10, 15 years after their injury, they still continue to struggle. Fortunately, that's the minority, um, but the answer to the question is yes, they can improve. Uh, there's a question here. Um, a discharge from an ER would have been given handouts, personality changes, reading list to progressive change, ultimately death result in this. I don't know if Nancy um, wants to ask that question live. Um, Nancy, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry I um, pressed the wrong button earlier. Um, had I known of some of the symptoms, uh, the personality change, uh, couldn't do math, et cetera, for my uh, spouse, um, it would have helped me to have reported that to the physicians that did see him more than once, but I wasn't aware of anything along those lines and I wasn't uh, prepared or knowledgeable enough to do my own research. Ultimately, uh, my husband died six months later from a subarachnoid hemorrhage that um, was, came on very suddenly. So my comment really is, um, hoping that at some point there is better instruction at the time uh, of a discharge for follow-up for the um, caregiver or spouse in this case to, to know what to look for uh, besides obvious things, uh, severe headaches, et cetera. That, that was the last thing that my husband said, uh, take me to the hospital, it's a severe headache. He thought he was having a stroke and that wasn't the case. So uh, if that makes any sense to you. Um, yeah, it does need to see that. It's still troubling me that I didn't know what some of these symptoms were. Maybe a surgery could have helped, but it was too late for that. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, Nancy. I'm, I'm terribly sorry for your loss. Um, uh, it's a tragic story. I, um, I will tell you that traumatic brain injury in general and concussion in particular is not something that's well covered educationally at the undergraduate or postgraduate level. As a neurology, as someone who was specializing in neurology, I got no instruction or education when it came to concussion and traumatic brain injury. Now, a lot has changed over the past 20 years. And now we have fellowships where we have neurologists and other specialists, sports medicine physicians who take a serious interest in this and actually specialize in this area. So we've come a long way, but we still have to do a much better job in educating the physicians like me um, who have been out there for a while, who really weren't educated on the topic of concussion. Uh, we, need, we need to do a much better job of educating them so that they, they know what to warn patients about. Um, I will tell you that some recent data from a large NIH-sponsored trial on mild traumatic brain injury showed that of patients coming to the ER with concussion, about two-thirds of them are never seen again in follow-up. So not only are they not necessarily given instruction, that's enough for them to, to um, that's appropriate in the ER, but they're not scheduled for a follow-up visit to be seen by a physician to see how they're coming along and to see how their recovery is coming along. And that's really unfortunate. So we have to do a, a better job at both the emergency department level, but also um, we need more physician trained who are expert in or are interested in this area so that, you know, there's places to send these individuals when they leave the ER where they can be seen and cared for and followed up so that, you know, tragic situations like that don't happen. Thank you. So there's a question here, um, fascinating presentations, theoretically an intervention that could expedite repair of the blood brain barrier or could provide some form of neuroprotective coverage if safe would be invaluable. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, it's all about coming up with a treatment that targets the injury. I think, you know, I, I uh, trained in the area of stroke medicine about 25 years ago. And back then when we were doing training in stroke, it was sometimes the joke was we were doing a fellowship in how to take aspirin, because that's all we could do for people when they had a stroke. We'd come into the hospital, we'd put them to bed and we'd knock on wood and hope that they made some, whatever recovery they could make. Um, now, now, of course, we have a, a much, we're much more aggressive in treating acute stroke, and that is sort of the prototypic brain injury. So, you know, we know what's happening in the brain during a traumatic brain injury. So we need to be much more aggressive in coming up with therapeutics that actually treat the injury at the point of contact so that we disrupt some of these pathological cascades that are triggered in the brain. Because really after the injury occurs, these cascades that are triggered continue and they can continue for days or weeks or months. And so we need to be much better at disrupting that to protect the brain from ongoing damage that occurs from, as this person asked, breakdown of the blood brain barrier where in inflammation, cells of inflammation can invade and infiltrate the brain. Sometimes resident inflammatory cells in the brain become reactive. And that inflammation leads to damage to the brain long after the injury is over. Um, some way to repair or protect that blood brain barrier would be important. We don't know how often this happens, but it seems that at least 50% and maybe up to two thirds of the time after a mild traumatic brain injury, there is breakdown of this blood brain barrier. So you remember that first slide I showed you that very complex uh, anatomy slide of what's happening at the cellular level. We know precisely what's happening. And so it's now up to us to move that into the research area and, do, and be much more aggressive in developing therapeutics to actually treat the brain injury, um, both acutely and you know, subacutely, even after the injury has occurred. There's a question here, is um, there data that shows a correlation between concussions and an increase in subsequent seizures in those who have suffered concussions. 
Yes, actually, um, traumatic brain injury is a risk factor for seizure. It's a risk factor for epilepsy. Um, and that's been recognized for quite some time. We don't know actually necessarily who's at risk for developing um, seizures, short-term or long-term after traumatic brain injury, but we do see that it happens. We've recognized this in patients with stroke too. Stroke is another sort of classical brain injury um, is a risk factor for the development of seizures and epilepsy long-term, even well after uh, the injury has occurred. So seizures and epilepsy is, is, uh, can happen after a mild traumatic brain injury. So question here for you, Sean, how do you foresee the NFLPA research impacting sports at the collegiate and high school levels in terms of concussion education and awareness? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, as it relates to protocol specifically, many of those um, protective measures have already been adopted at all levels of sports. As it relates to research in particular, I think that goes well beyond um, youth sports, uh, NCAA, and it goes to the society at large. Just by way of example, the Dementia Discovery Fund um, is looking to create cures or treatments for various types of dementia and have been had some early success in that. That obviously goes well beyond the, the level of sport. Similarly, um, in connection with our longitudinal study, we're finding some very interesting connections with microvascular disease and long-term brain health. Again, that's gonna benefit everybody uh, in, this, in society, not just youth sports, NCAA, or the professional level. So Leston Ney had his hand raised, I'm told. Leston, do you have a question? Yes, I yes, do. I, I'm a neurologist who has been involved in uh, cognitive issues for many, many years. I wonder whether uh, the term that we use, symptoms, is should be reassessed. Uh, it seems to be related to either uh, peripheral observations by others, or sometimes self-assessment by the subject. But surely many of the changes with concussions are sub-symptomatic. And I think that our assessments are rather crude, frankly. And it may be one of the reasons why uh, we need over hitting people, uh, tra tra traumatic injuries over and over again to begin to become apparent. I'm also a little concerned about FMR studies that require multiple uh, assessments in order to to find information. Uh, the assessments occur, or rather, the injuries occur over a very short period of time. And we, I don't think we have the techniques available yet to really see what's going on in that same time reference. Uh, might, for instance, uh, time frequency studies with electroencephalography pr produce some additional information. We don't do those much any, at, yet anyway, uh, but uh, it's a way to look much more quickly at much more refined levels, uh, whether it's uh, applicable or not, I don't know, but it's an issue. So Leston, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, as I mentioned, we don't have a diagnostic test yet for concussion. Right. And as I also mentioned, we're only hitting the tip of the iceberg when we consider concussions, because concussion really means the emergence of symptoms as a result of a traumatic brain injury. And Underneath the tip of that iceberg are all these, especially athletes and military operators who are taking multiple repetitive sub-concussive, as you put it, impacts that can lead to brain injury, as, as I demonstrated. So that's why I, I have to believe that in the future, you know, there are biomarkers that are appearing in saliva and in blood immediately after a concussion and within the hours to days after a concussion. But at the end of the day, if you have an individual who has a high exposure risk, let's say a high school hockey player, a high school football player, or a soccer player, 
And whether or not they're reporting symptoms, whether they're hiding their symptoms or whether or not they truly don't have symptoms, but they have an injury. I think that's where the blood and the saliva bio biomarkers are going to be valuable. I don't think that imaging, because imaging is expensive, right? And we're not going to be able to do imaging on all these people. But if we can have someone spit into a tube, right? Or take um, you know, a finger stick blood sample and put it on a piece of paper and have, a, have, a and, and have that as a diagnostic test, that at the end of the day, I think is where we're going. Not only in just concussed individuals, but people with a high exposure risk to repetitive head impact so that we can, we can take an athlete, like I showed you in those imaging studies, who is experiencing not only changes in brain function or structure, but it's leading to you know, changes in cognition that may or may not be recognized by that individual or even family members, but can lead to long-term consequences. So Lesson, I, I couldn't agree with your comment more. We got a I long wonder, way to go. I wonder if I, one of the things that concerns me is, does everybody really want to know? And I, I'll let it go with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, for children and adolescents, whether they want to know, maybe they're not in, in the best position to know what's good for them. And so, you know, I, I think we have an obligation to children and adolescents to know what's happening to their brain because 99.5% of them will not go on to play in the National Football League and will not go on to be professional athletes. So we have a responsibility to children and adolescents to protect their brain. When it comes to uh, you know, an elite football player in the National Football League or National Hockey League, they know exactly what they're signing up for, right? Um, and they know exactly what the risks are and they can choose to take those risks um, for, for the benefits they get, they get from playing in that sport. Sean, do you have a comment about that? Yeah, Lesson, it's a, it's a great point. And I think a decade ago, it was a massive concern for the union on behalf of the players um, to make sure that all the risks were known and everybody was educated and we've been fighting that fight. But I'll give you a quick anecdote um, that sort of still proves your point today. Um, we had a player at one of our health and safety meetings in the context of discussing concussion protocols that talked about the importance of these standardized approaches to healthcare because ultimately he's gonna to wanna to go back in the game. He's gonna to wanna to catch the game winning touchdown. He's gonna to wanna get paid for playing at a high level. And so he pointed at us and the doctors in the room and he said, you know, it is your job to protect me from myself. And that was sort of the blessing from our player leadership to say, you know, you have to make the most conservative, most responsible medical decisions, even though we're sort of, this is what we call the 80-80 rule, that you have, you know, eight, you know, hundred thousand or eighty thousand in the stadium and eight million at home watching it, right? That doesn't take control over the fact that this is still individuals' health care and it has to be treated as such. So it's it's a good point and it's one that informs our efforts. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Lester, for the questions. Well, we'd love to be able to get to all of the questions. I haven't seen so many questions pour in during one of these salons, and we just, unfortunately, we just can't get to them all. But uh, Maybe, maybe we'll have to do an encore, uh, Sean, in the future and come back and answer some of these questions. Um, less talking, more answering questions, I guess. Um, so before we say goodbye tonight, I want to thank you once again for, for joining us. And we host these virtual uh, salon events every month, and we'd love to see you again. You can follow us. Um, here's a, here's a, an update on some events that are, that are coming up uh, in the near future. And so please, uh, please join us for those in, in, uh, in September and in October. Look forward to seeing you again. Thanks once again for, uh, for coming tonight, for donating your time. And uh, thank you for the contributions that you've made to the American Brain Foundation. We sincerely appreciate them. And um, we take it very seriously. We want to put the, your, your support to the best use possible. So thanks again for your time and, and for your interest in the American Brain Foundation. Have a great night.